Does anyone know what Sierra Stone is? My wife does. When I, about 20 years ago, when we were first married, I worked for a company called Sierra Stone. And Sierra Stone, I think the technical definition was crushed aggregate mixed with epoxy to be put over top of concrete. Uh, basically what we did is we made bad concrete look better. So this is obviously the before. It looks like birdseed, but I gotta tell you, it was not as light as birdseed. Um, heavy, heavy job, like hard, hard work. I was like lifting up 80 pound bags, carrying them from the truck down to the backyard usually, that's where the pool was or wherever we were working, and then going back for more and again and again and again. So I was working hard. I, I lost weight that summer. Um, my muscles grew, my body tightened. I remember um, at one point taking my shirt off when I got home and Kathy looked at me and she said, you're looking good. <laughs> and I said, thank you. <laughs> now the reason I was looking good at that moment is because I was looking bad before that. <laughs> so um, before we got married, I had a couple different jobs, but one of the jobs I worked at was a video store. At a video store is like Netflix, for those who uh, don't know. <laughs> but you actually had to walk into the store. Now, I didn't work at a Blockbuster or like any like name brand one. The one I worked at was called Super Dave's Video. And it was owned by a guy named Dave, and people in high school called him Super Dave. And he started a video store. So very, very low, low I'll say low class video store. I don't mean trashy, other than that the building was like ready to fall down. So it wasn't, it wasn't like a high end one, it was like, it was just like a, it was a bad video store. <laughs> but it was an easy job. You know, Friday, Friday night, Saturday would be, would be busy, but any other time in the week, it was just like sit there and watch movies for the occasional customer that would come in. And he said to me, if you ever get hungry, you know, just grab a chocolate bar off the shelf there. So my job was basically sit there with my feet up, Occasionally say hello to a customer and eat chocolate bars. Sierra Stone was hard work. The other thing, I didn't tell you this. I gotta tell you. I, I would carry the, the stone down and then we'd mix it with epoxy in, in this like big trough and then I would sit there and I'd have to shovel it back and forth to mix it up, fill it with buckets, then carry it over. I just don't want you under, to underestimate how much I worked that summer, okay? It was really hard. <laughs> The video store was easy work. You know, it was air conditioned, free candy. It was like, ask most people which they might prefer. They're going to choose the video store over the other one. It is easiest to choose the path of least resistance, but that usually isn't the best thing for us. You guys have heard the saying, no pain, no gain, right? How many of us choose pain when we can avoid it? No, I, don't get me wrong, I know I'm speaking to a lot of military people here, and in my opinion, a lot of you have chosen pain when you might have otherwise been able to avoid it. We watch, we watch some of these shows like World's Toughest Challenge. Anyone seen that? Uh, it's adventure racing, people who put themselves like intentionally in these like horrible situations that I would not do like as punishment for anybody else, and they want to do it. You know, they want to push themselves, they want to drive themselves. I, I don't think that's, you know, 99% of the population. I think most of us choose to avoid pain whenever we can. In fact, we might even think that if you experience, uh, sorry, if, if we, we usually see pain and hardship and difficulty as signs that we're on the wrong track. And if you experience any of those things, you might think that God is punishing you. If, if you have bad things happen in your life, maybe it's just me, but I sometimes think to myself, what did I do wrong? You know, why is God punishing me? Why is, why is this happening to me? And what have I, how did I go off track? But here's the truth. You can be in the center of God's will and still find yourself in a terrible situation. You can be right in the middle, center of God's will, and still find yourself in a terrible situation. And I know this because we see it throughout history. You know, we're going to look at some stories today, but, but I mean, just look at the apostles. I, do you want to tell me that Paul was not in the center of God's will? Going around town to town, preaching the gospel, making disciples, preaching the name of Jesus and getting beaten and whipped and stoned and left for dead, eventually, literally killed. And that's true for like all the apostles. 
and people throughout history, the martyrs of the faith, people who were in the center of God's will, doing what God wanted them to do, wanted them to do, and yet they ended up giving their lives. So you can be in the center of God's will and still find yourself in a terrible situation. But God will sometimes use a bad situation not to punish you, but to develop you. Now I want to be clear, I'm not saying that God causes the bad situations. Most of the time, uh, we get ourselves into those bad situations. We don't need help with that. I I want you to know there's no correlation between how easy life is and how much God loves you. There's no correlation between how easy life is and how much God loves you. So we are doing a series. We kind of started last week with the kids' series, but or service, but um, we're really getting into it today called Lost and Found, Finding Jesus in the Wilderness. And so these are going to be stories that I heard when I was in Sunday school. And I, I even tried to make this look like a flannel graph. Do you guys know what flannel graph is? How many? Show of hands. Okay, so those are the people who grew up in Sunday school. Um, if you didn't, flannel graph was like a, a piece of flannel, you know, on a board. And the teacher, usually uh, an older woman, would be sitting there teaching this story. And she would take little figures and put them and stick them to the flannel graph. And because of static electricity, they would stick. And you can move the person around and... You know, you, I don't think we do that much today. I, I actually thought about getting like a flannel graph up here and teaching, but I just thought, I, I like the, the screen. But I think the idea is that we understand people often are visual learners, and it helps to have some kind of image to go along with the story that we're, we're learning. And so these are the stories that, that I learned. And I, I said uh, when I was first writing this, you know, these stories stuck to me the same way the characters stuck to the board. Like they just, they stuck with me. And these are, these are the stories that I remember from when I was a kid, but we don't often talk about them here in, in adult church. We don't, we don't usually talk about them uh, outside of Sunday school. But I also wanted to know, what can they teach us today? What can they teach us about Jesus today? Because a lot, I mean, these are all Old Testament stories we'll be looking at. It's the time of the Israelites in the, the wilderness, the time between uh, the time when they were in slavery and the time they go into the promised land. And you won't see Jesus' name in there. But I am going to say, every week, we're going to hear from Jesus. So this takes place in the ancient Near East, uh, starting in Africa. So they, they, they leave Egypt, and last week we heard about how they crossed the Red Sea, and then they're down in, in this area, somewhere around this area. Now, you, you notice, if they're going to the Promised Land, it's here, and that's the way you would normally go, just along the, the shoreline. But God didn't just want to get them out of Egypt. He wanted to get Egypt out of them as well. So he said, I, I need to take some time to take you to this different place and, and teach you who I want you to be. Now, it ended up being a lot longer than God you know, probably wished it had, had worked out uh, because of the, the, the nature of the people. We'll talk about that as we go on. But that's the area. The time is a little bit trickier. Uh, Exodus is usually given a date of 1446 before Christ. 1,446 years before Christ. Um, But we don't know that for sure. 1225 is sometimes also a date that's given. Uh, We don't know, like, we we don't know the name of the Pharaoh. That would have helped a lot. If we had known the name of the Pharaoh, we could have dated it according to uh, external history. There's, uh, I'm saying scholars are kind of divided on this, and there's evidence for either date, and and other ones in between as well. So, um, just know it was at least a thousand years before Christ, and, and probably a little bit longer than that. So, in the Bible, if you have a Bible, you can turn to Exodus chapter 15, starting in verse 22. So we've just heard the story about uh, Moses crossing through the Red Sea and leading his people. If you weren't here last week, uh, they, they're in danger, they're up against the Red Sea, and, and the army of Pharaoh is coming behind to get them, and God says, you know, put your, put your staff out, and he separates the water, and they walk across on dry land, and God rescues them. Then we move on. It says, Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea, and they moved out into the desert of Shur. Now, what do we know about deserts? Not a lot of water. So they're moving from a place that had a lot of water, the Red Sea. In fact, it had more water than the Israelites originally wanted, certainly more than the Egyptians eventually wanted, but they move it into the desert, a place where there's no water, or very little. And they traveled in this desert for three days without finding any water. 
Anyone familiar with the rule of three? At least a couple people. So the idea, I mean, I don't think it's a universal truth, but the rule of three is that you can go three minutes without air. I certainly couldn't, but, you know, who knows? Maybe if I absolutely had to, maybe I could. But they're saying almost nobody can go three minutes beyond three minutes without air. Almost no one can go beyond three days without water. And you start to starve to death after three weeks without food. I thought that was three hours originally, but no, it's three, three weeks. <laughs> So this is a serious situation. There, there are three days in this desert without finding any water. How do you feel if you are being led by God's representative? You know, you, you're, you're hearing Moses say, you know, I'm speaking for God. You've seen these amazing things happen. And now you're walking into the desert three days. You are dying of thirst. I mean, maybe, maybe they had some with them. Maybe they brought some with them. But that doesn't last very long, especially in the desert. And then they come to the oasis of Mara. And you think, oh, finally, we get some water. They get there, the water was too bitter to drink. So they called the place Mara, which means bitter. And I'm guessing that also was true about their attitude. I think they were probably more bitter than the water at this point. I mean, you are, you are hoping and dying, dying of thirst, looking for water. You finally find water, and you find out that it's too bitter to drink. And I think it's probably not unreasonable. Let's just say it this way. I think I probably would have reacted the same way that these people react. The people complained and turned to Moses, what are we going to drink, they demanded. Some of these people had children, right? I, I can just imagine being a father in this situation. You know, your, your wife and your children are dying of thirst. I'd be angry. I'd be complaining as well. What are we going to drink, they demanded. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help. So the people turned to Moses, and Moses turns to the people. You can almost imagine, you know, the direct line. The, the kid cries out to the parent. The parent, you know, cries out to the tribal leader. The tribal leader goes to Moses to cry out. And Moses cried out to the Lord for help. The Lord showed him a piece of wood. Moses threw it into the water, and this made the water good to drink. And I read this, I thought, is there, is there any legitimacy to this, like scientific legitimacy? I, I don't personally need it. Let me just say that. I mean, God could have said, throw sand in there, and it would happen, right? Like, there's, there's nothing, there's no scientific reason that Moses should have been able to put his staff into the water and had the water separate. So I, I, I don't need to, to believe that God can do an amazing miracle. But I know sometimes God uses natural things, just the timing is what's miraculous. And, uh, and I looked into it, and I, I didn't write down the name of the, the, the nut, but there is apparently some nut from this area here that when you crunch it up and put it in water, I've actually seen some YouTube videos, uh, they stir it up and it draws the bitterness into the nut and leaves the rest of the water safe to drink. I thought, that is so cool. We're talking about a huge amount of water for all these people, and Moses throws a piece of wood in there. So... Take from that what you will. I'm looking at this and saying, God is doing a miracle. And why would God do that? It was there at Mara that God set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness to him. He said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands, keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. God wanted to get his people out of Egypt. He wanted to get Egypt out of his people. What I mean by that is like the, the traditions, the understanding. You know, if you go to ancient Egypt, you're going to hear about all these different gods and, and goddesses. And if you grow up in that kind of culture, you may not necessarily know what is right. And God wanted to say, I am your God. I'm the one who's going to split the waters for you. I'm the one who's going to lead you to water. I'm going to make it drinkable when it's not drinkable. You put your faith in me. You put your trust in me, and I'm going to look after you. I'm the God who's going to provide for you. I'm the God who's going to heal you. You know, we were singing that song earlier, uh, Days of Elijah, and there's that one verse that repeats itself. There's no God like Jehovah. 
And, you know, sometimes I, I'm here, I, I grew up in the church, and so I've heard all these, this, these languages before. Uh, I'm wondering how many people here might be here for the first time and thinking, who's Jehovah? You know, who, I've heard of Jesus, I've heard of God, I'm, uh, Jehovah, Holy Spirit, what a, uh, you know, I'm the Lord who heals you. The word there is Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Jireh is another name. God has all these different names. I mean, it's just one God, but he has all these different names. Uh, different ways that we relate to him. Different ways we understand him. And right here he tells them, I'm the Lord who heals you. I want to heal you from everything that you're coming out of. Imagine the PTSD of being a slave. I want to heal you out of that. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. And so after leaving Mara, the Israelites traveled on, the, traveled on to the oasis of Elam, where they found 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they camped there beside the water. I mean, this is what you've been looking for, forward to, right? Let my people go out of Egypt, cross the Red Sea. We're looking for somewhere to, to drink. You get this bitter water, and even if you clean it up, it's probably got pieces of wood in it, not very good. But now... They get to Elam. I mean, this is the promised land, isn't it? Twelve springs of water. How many tribes of Israel? Twelve. It's like a spring per tribe. It's awesome. Seventy trees. I couldn't figure that out. It should have been 72. Right? Easily divisible by 12. Um, I, think, I think what that means is 70 is like the, the number they used to say more than you can count. Just like the perfect number of palm trees. This is the place that God wants them to be at, right? Isn't it? Exodus 16, I mean, that almost sounds like the end of the story. It's the end of the chapter, because we split it up that way, but we go on to Exodus 16, the very next verse. Then the whole community of Israel set out from Elam and journeyed into the wilderness of Sin. Pronounced Sin, apparently. Between Elam and Mount Sinai. This is, this is the area based on the mountain of Sinai. Um, I couldn't help but read this and say the wilderness of sin. Right? You're like, you, you are in this perfect place, and now God is calling you out into the wilderness of sin? Does that make sense? Am I reading that right? Um, I want to make sure we understand that this is, this is just happens to be the same word that we associate with sin. It, it doesn't, it's not the same meaning. God never leads us into sin. Wilderness or otherwise. Uh, we, we do that on our own. But we're going to see from the story, it's possible to sin even when God is leading you. But they seem to be in this perfect place, and, and God's leading them out of it towards Mount Sinai, because God's got a mission, he's got something that he wants to accomplish with these people. And they arrived there on the 15th day of the second month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. There too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. Why? What's the rule of three? They have now been at least three weeks, probably, without food. And they're hungry. And they have very selective memories about Egypt. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you've brought us in the wilderness to starve us all to death. I, again, I'm torn because if I was there, I'd probably be doing the same thing. And knowing myself, I would probably be complaining as well. It's so surprising, though, when you read this in just like a couple of chapters, how quickly they go from celebrating, praising God for saving them to now complaining about why'd you bring us out here to die? Like, we trust you enough to cross over on dry land, but we don't trust you enough to provide food for us in the wilderness. And I think there's probably a lesson there for us. And I don't want to be like that. I want to be somebody who trusts God no matter what. The Lord said to Moses, Look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. I will test them in this to see whether, they, whether or not they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they will gather food, and when they prepare it, there will be twice as much as usual. So interesting rules. God made them, and we have to abide by God's rules. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, By evening you will realize it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaints, which are against him and not against us. What, we have done, what, what have we done that you should complain about us? They're, they're wanting them to understand, listen, when you complain, 
against us. You're actually complaining against God because God is the one who's leading us. And you're going to see God's glory. And I don't know about you, when I think of God's glory, I think of like this kind of an image where like the, the sun beating down and just like this amazing monumental thing. Like that's the glory of God. And yet, did we not see the glory of God in the provision in the wilderness with the water? Did we not see the glory of God when they threw a piece of wood in there and it made bitter water sweet? Like, that's as much the glory of God. And I think we have a tendency to miss the glory of God when it's not mag- uh, magnificent in this, this manner. The glory of God can sometimes go missed because it doesn't, it doesn't look like we expect it to look. Verse 8, Then Moses added, The Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening and bread to satisfy you in the morning, for he has heard all your complaints against him. What have we done? Yes, your complaints are against the Lord, not against us. Then Moses said to Aaron, Announce this to the entire community of Israel. Present yourselves before the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. I don't know about you, I, I don't want to be the Israelite who hears the word, God has heard your complaining. I would have preferred to hear, uh, God has heard your concerns. God, God has heard you, you know, that you are in trouble. He's heard you crying out. When you hear that God has heard you complaining, all of a sudden it makes you realize that you've been sitting against him. As Aaron spoke to the whole community of Israel, they looked out toward the wilderness, and there they could see the awesome glory of the Lord in the cloud. It's like, that's the evidence that, of God, the one you're complaining against. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the Israelites' complaints. Now tell them, in the evening you will have meat to eat, and in the morning you will have bread, all the bread you want, and then you will know that I am the Lord your God. So there's a little bit of redundancy here. You know, God tells them, and he tells them again to tell the people, and Moses tells the people. So all that to understand that, that God is going to be the God that provides for them, and they're going to be able to trust him. So that evening, vast numbers of quail flew in and covered the camp. Now, it's, it's actually um, not a miracle that the quail was there, because that, apparently that's the route that the, the quail normally take. But it's a miracle that happens the morning after, or sorry, the, the evening after God tells the people there's going to be quail. You're going to have meat. And the next morning, as far as I can understand, there's no scientific evidence for this. The next morning, um, sorry, I don't mean there's no scientific evidence. I, I mean, there's no, there's no justification outside of this being a miracle. The next morning, the area around the camp was wet with dew. When the dew evaporated, a flaky substance as fine as frost blanketed the ground. The Israelites were puzzled. When they saw it, what is it? They asked each other. They had no idea what it was. Moses told them, It is the food the Lord has given you to eat. These are the Lord's instructions. Each household should gather as much as it needs. Pick up two quarts for each person in your tent. So the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some only a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what it needed. God may not always give you what you want, but he will give you what you need. And if God tells you it's going to be enough, it will be enough. So then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until morning. But some of them didn't listen and kept some of it till morning. They didn't trust God. I, two things. I, one of two things. They either didn't trust that there would be food in the morning, or they didn't want to go out and, and work again in the morning. They, maybe laziness. I think it's probably more of the former. But some of them kept some until morning, but by then it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. And Moses was very angry with them. It's a question, are you going to obey God or are you going to be disobedient? And that same question is true for us today. How is it going to happen? After this, the people gathered the food morning by morning, each family according to its needs, and as the sun became hot, the flakes they had not picked up melted and disappeared. Again, no scientific under- like reasoning for that. It's just a miracle. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as usual, four quarts, for each person instead of two. Remember before it went bad? Well, God told them to do it this way, so if they follow God's rules, it should work out. Then all the leaders of the community came and asked Moses for an explanation. He told them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. So bake or boil as much as you want today, and set aside what is left for tomorrow. Imagine telling a group of people who have been slaves their whole life, that you get a day off. I mean, it's just unheard of for a slave. It's probably unheard of in that day and age as well, that God wants you to rest. So they put some aside until morning, 
just as Moses had commanded. In the morning, the leftover food was wholesome and good, without maggots or odor. Again, it makes no sense, except for that God told them to do it, and therefore it makes sense. Moses said, eat this food today, for today is a Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord. There will be no food on the ground today. You may gather the food for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. There will be no food on the ground that day. Some of the people went, away, went, went out anyway on the seventh day, but they found no food. The Lord asked Moses, how long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions? Don't look for satisfaction where God has told you you won't find it. If God says not to do something, don't do it. God continues, so they must realize that the Sabbath is is the Lord's gift to you. That is why he gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day, so there will be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day, you must each stay in your place. Do not go out and pick up food on the seventh day, for the people do not gather any food on the seventh day. All of that to say, are you going to obey God, or are you going to choose to disobey? The Israelites called the food manna. It was white like coriander seed, and it tasted like honey wafers. I thought like sugar crisps. I mean, that's kind of what the, the vibe we're going for here. Um, now, the funny thing here, the word manna is the Hebrew word for what is it? So it's like, what do you want for dinner? I don't know. Okay. You're having manna. It's, I don't know. And then, and then there's some other parts in here that we're not going to read about, but God tells them to gather some up and to put it in the ark that they haven't built yet. So Exodus chapter 17. At the Lord's command, the whole community of Israel left the wilderness of Sin and moved from place to place. Eventually they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water there for the people to drink. So once more, the people complained against Moses. Give us water to drink, they they demanded. Again, how, how can you go through this and not trust God to provide for you? How can you say, you know, we've seen what's happened in the past, but we're not trusting him in the future. And yet, I'd be in the same space. If I was thirsty, I would be like complaining. Why are, why are you brought us out to kill us? Quiet, Moses replied. Why are you complaining against me? And why are you testing the Lord? A reminder that you know, when you complain against me, you complain against God. But tormented by thirst, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Why are you trying to kill us, our children, our livestock with thirst? Makes no sense. Why would they actually want to do that? I, People are unreasonable when they're thirsty. You're not yourself when you're hungry. Right? When Moses cried out to the Lord, then Moses cried, cried to the Lord, what should I do with these people? They're ready to stone me. And again, that's what we do. Right? We, don't, we don't complain to each other. We cry out to God. Ask God for help. The Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people. Take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile, and call some of the elders of Israel to join you. I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Strike the rock, and water will come gushing out. And then the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he was told. The water gushed out as the elders looked on. Moses named the place Massa, which means test, and Meribah, which means arguing, because the people of Israel argued with Moses and tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord here with us or not? So, as we see, God's leading them in the wilderness because he wants to create in in them a people that he wants them to be. And with that, it's going to be some testing. You can be in the center of God's will and still find yourself thirsty and hungry. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Looking back, he's talking about this. He said, yes, God humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone, Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. God allowed them to be hungry so that he could come to the rescue. He wanted them to understand, I am the one you come to. If you had your way, you might go running back to Egypt to get those pots of meat and all the bread you can eat and be slaves again. But I want you to be free, and I want you to come to me because I'm the one who's going to provide for you. Now, where do we find Jesus in the story? John chapter 6, verse 32 says, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. Like The the people of Israel might have thought, well, it's Moses who's doing this, but it's not Moses. My father did. God the Father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the the world. 
Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 38. Uh, they're at this festival commemorating the time when, they, when God provided them water from, a, from the rock. This is the exact story. And on the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will, fro- will flow from his heart. So you want bread? You find it in Jesus. You know, if you're hungry... If you're spiritually hungry, you find, it in, you find your answer in Jesus. If you're spiritually thirsty, you quench that thirst only in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, uh, Paul writes about this, and he says you know, that, that all of them ate the same spiritual food, all of them drank the same spiritual water. They drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them. That rock was Christ. He's literally saying that, that Jesus was in the desert with them. So I want you to trust that God is with you. Trust that God is good, and trust that God will give you what you need. Not always what you want, because sometimes that's not good for us, but God will give you what you need. When you're hungry, look to Jesus. When you're thirsty, look to Jesus. When you're tired and weary, look to Jesus. God will sometimes use a bad situation, not to punish you, but to develop you. And again, there's no correlation between how easy life is and how much God loves you. If anything, I think the opposite is true. The times in my life when I felt closest to God are the times when I've been going through the greatest hardship. I imagine that's probably true for some of you. You can be in the center of God's will and still find yourself in a terrible situation. Sometimes our good shepherd leads us beside still waters, but sometimes we have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The point is to stay close to the good shepherd. The point is always to look to Jesus. We invite our worship team to come up. We're going to move into a time of communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, telling them uh, about this sacrament that we're about to take part in. He said, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. If you are hungry, Jesus is the bread of life. If you are thirsty, Jesus says, come and drink. I'm going to pray and ask you to come forward. Uh, The way it works best is that we come up through these aisles and back to your seat through the middle aisle. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for finding us in the wilderness, for leading us through the wilderness. God, even though we might be in situations that that don't seem ideal to us, we, we know that you can use those to develop us into the people you want us to be. I pray, Lord, that those times when we get spiritually hungry and spiritually thirsty, that we will not look for the answer anywhere else outside of you, but we will always choose to turn to you and be satisfied only in you. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. In your name. Amen. As you're ready, come forward.